Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne. Kevin Lamar James. You may have never heard of him, but back in 2005, he had a diabolical scheme to wage war against the United States, all from the comfort of his cell at Folsom Prison. James radicalized and recruited other inmates to participate in what the FBI called at the time the most operationally advanced terrorism plot since 9-11. Welcome to Behind the Crime Scene. I'm Gina Osborne, retired FBI assistant special agent in charge and former Army counterintelligence agent. On today's show, we're talking homegrown violent extremists and prison radicalization. Say that three times fast. Well, it's a case that is little known in the public, but it was wildly significant, and it went down in 2005. It's called the JIS case. Now, it's important for you to know, right after 9-11 and the years following, the environment for the FBI and those working terrorism was crazy. So before 9-11, the top priority for the FBI, organized crime, drugs, gangs, anything criminal, that was the top priority. And then after 9-11, there was this huge shift. So terrorism became the number one priority. So that meant a lot of criminal agents had to turn in to terrorism agents because pretty much everybody was working terrorism after 9-11. For an extended period of time. Not only were we reinventing ourselves from an investigative agency to become an intelligence agency, but there was a tremendous amount of scrutiny on every lead, every case relating to terrorism, whether it was an angry neighbor lead where I don't like my neighbor, I think they're a terrorist, to major terrorism activity going on within the United States that had to be investigated. But regardless, whether it was a lead or a case, the FBI was responsible for ensuring the safety of the American public. And that's what people did all day, every day, day in and day out. Our guest on the show today is Eric Velas Villar. He knows about what was going on in terrorism back in the day because he was the assistant special agent in charge of counterterrorism for the Los Angeles division when this case went on. So to tell you a little bit about Eric, he is a security investigative and intelligence leader, and he served over 30 years with the FBI. He rose through the ranks to lead the FBI's intelligence branch, making sure that All the dots were connected in all of the investigations worldwide. He was then the head of security for Disney's theme parks, cruise ships, resorts, and stores, and is now the founder and CEO of the Velas Investigative Group. Now let's go behind the crime scene with Eric Velas and talk about the JIS terrorism case. Welcome to the show, Eric. Hey, Gina. How are you? Such a long time. It's good to be talking to you. Great to be talking to you as well. Eric, this is such a fascinating case. How did it all begin? Yeah, definitely. This case started much like all the other cases where we would get a phone call, then we would run down the particular leads. But I remember in this particular case, I had some friends flying in from San Antonio. And this was one of those nights where I was going to be able to go out with him and his wife and my wife. We were going to enjoy this nice dinner. And these were rare occasions because we were constantly you know, working and following leads. And sure enough, we're right in the middle of this beautiful dinner down in South Orange County, and the phone goes off. And it's Randy, Randy Parsons, who led the counterterrorism program back in Los Angeles, who was my boss. Oh, I remember those Randy Parsons calls. They always meant we had to scramble to run something down. Oh, absolutely. This call was a little different because, you know, we always get the calls about, hey, we got something going on here. And you kind of, your gut kind of got tuned into understanding the ones that were kind of the more serious ones and others that, you know, you would run down relatively quickly. But I remember just hearing Randy's voice and he said, Eric, I think this one is a for reals. And if you know Randy, like, you know, the way he said it, it's a for reals. I just knew this was a little different. He began to tell me about this particular case that the Torrance Police Department had referred to the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the fact that they had arrested a couple guys uh, were robbing some gas stations 
and that I should get over to the Torrance Police Department right away. I'm met there by the Long Beach Joint Terrorism Task Force and the members of the Torrance Police Department, and we and I start to get briefed up on what's going on. Can you explain how they connected the gas station robberies to terrorism? The Torrance PD was already looking to figure out what was going on with all this this chain of string of gas station robberies. And in this particular case, one of the guys drops his cell phone. And the cell phone is then traced back to a particular location, and they go in and conduct the search. And at that location, they find a, a lot of jihadi material. There's pictures of bin Laden, and there's these these manuals and these different things that just raise the alarm. That's what caused the Torrance Police Department to reach out to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So who do they have in custody? So we had both the guys that were arrested. One was uh, LeVar Washington, and the other was Gregory Patterson. Now, LeVar Washington was a member of the um, Rolling 60s Crips, a gang member, um, more hardcore. And, you know, we thought, okay, this is the guy that's probably not going to be talking much. While in the other room, we had Gregory Patterson, a younger guy, no criminal background. I think he was 21 years old. From a law enforcement perspective, we thought, okay, that's the guy that's going to be kind of giving us a lot of details while the the former gang member is not. And it turned out to be just the opposite. So as this case begins to unfold, what we start to notice is that, first of all, there's an individual who's a prisoner up in Folsom by the name of Kevin James. Kevin James is a very charismatic leader of a group called JIS. And this was a group of radicalized prison inmates who were really into this hardcore philosophy of anti-U.S. type of a Sunni extremism type of uh, uh, philosophy. And it's important to note that Kevin James was born in the United States and he was in prison for robbery convictions, not terrorism. Oh, absolutely. And this group in Folsom Prison had already grown to several dozen members. The way that it worked was that Kevin James, back in 1997, he actually wrote this manual, which was the JIS manual of everything about the foundation of the group, the principles they believed in. And he used this manual along with his charisma to recruit people. He was very interested in people that he could convert or radicalize into his way of thinking that were going to be released soon because these folks could go out and actually spread this type of philosophy outside. And so what we start seeing was that that LeVar Washington, he had spent time with Kevin James and had become one of those folks. And since he was going to be released in 2004, Kevin James really seized upon that opportunity to get Washington fully on board and to send them out, so to speak, to begin recruiting and building a terrorism cell within the Los Angeles area to go after specifically targeting U.S. military installations, army recruiting stations, and members of the Jewish community. Or, for example, the El Al ticket counter at LAX was one of their intended targets. And so this had all the markings of a radicalization process that started in prison, but that had already spread out into the streets of Los Angeles. It fascinated me how Washington, a hardcore rolling 60s gang member and a U.S. citizen, could have been radicalized to become a terrorist. These folks, Washington, I mean, these they they had bought in completely to this philosophy. In fact, he was the one who recruited Gregory Patterson. Gregory Patterson was a recent convert to Islam, um, no criminal background, no indication of any type of violence. But Patterson really bought into this philosophy that LeVar Washington was selling to him. How did the gas station robberies fall into Kevin James's plan? Yeah, so the actual gas station robberies were a way for them to fund their terrorism activities or their planned terrorism activities. And they specifically chose gas stations as a symbolic way because they believed that the U.S. presence were oppressing Muslim countries and it was all because of oil. So this is how deeply they had bought into this, that even the way that they stole or that they raised their money to criminal activity was all symbolic. How many people were involved in the conspiracy? 
So when we first get wind of it, we, we realize we have two in custody at the time. We have LeVar Washington and Gregory Patterson. We then, through the interviews of LeVar Washington, we find out about Kevin James. At this point, we know there's three that we have fully identified. But one of the scary things that Washington had mentioned was that there were a lot more people who had been kind of converted, so to speak, into this kind of radicalized way of thinking and they were already out of prison. So as you can remember, back in, I mean, Los Angeles is huge. So now we have to find nine people, which we know very little about, that we knew spent time in prison with Kevin James, but were somewhere out in Los Angeles. So we had these three, and it, it wasn't long after that that we identify a fourth member of the group. This occurs during surveillance because we immediately initiated 24-7 surveillance to kind of find out, you know, what's going on in the area. And we find out that they're associated with this guy named Hamad Samana. And he was a a young Pakistani male who had arrived to the U.S. Again, no indication of any type of violence or anything. He was actually teaching Arabic at at a local mosque. But he, too, came into contact with Washington. And Washington was the one who brainwashed him into this way of thinking. And so now you had Washington leading it, and you had Gregory Patterson and Samana that were part of this three-man cell. So with Washington and Patterson in custody, I'm sure surveillance on Samana was a 24-hour operation. Oh, absolutely. This is interesting about this story because it's an amazing story of police work and just really good cooperation. But a lot of folks don't really remember this at all. It's it's a landmark case when it comes to radicalization. But sometimes you wonder, like, why isn't that we didn't hear more about it? I remember very distinctly after driving up the 405 to the Torrance Police Department, we had the two guys in custody being interviewed. And I was sitting in the conference room with one of the Torrance Police Detectives And up on the television screen, it's one of these breaking news events. And as I looked up, I could see this red bus and the top of it had been blown off. And so the date was July 7th of 2005 in London. And of course, we we all know what happened that day um, with the London bombing cases. So this was a time, not only was it we were... We were already heightened because we were not far away from 9-11, but now we had this major international terrorism case on our hands. And so we literally at this point were all hands on deck. And one of the neat things about the Joint Terrorism Task Force and really about the partnerships in Los Angeles was that in order to do something like 24-7 surveillance round the clock for an unlimited period of time, you need a lot of resources. And I remember the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department basically taking the lead on that and they were the ones who set up the surveillance plans for us and made sure they were all, everything was manned and we had plenty of manpower. So yeah, it was, it was a monumental effort from many different agencies. I still can't get over the fact that Washington cooperated and gave so much insight into the plot. Yeah, it, it is funny because you would think when we had these two guys in custody, you would think that the one who would be like basically telling us everything because he'd be terrified would have been Gregory Patterson because again no criminal history but this is this is the interesting part he was so into what he believed was he was doing this the right thing and kind of so into this whole thing that he wasn't saying a word I mean he pretty much didn't cooperate at all one interesting thing about Gregory Patterson to show you kind of how much he had bought into this We ended up learning later on in the investigation as we're going through different letters that are going back and forth between Washington and Kevin James. There's one letter in particular where Kevin James, this is the the, the leader up in Folsom, is upset at the fact that Gregory Patterson has quit a job that he had at at LAX. So, I mean, they thought that they had pretty much scored the mother load because now they actually had one of their members working inside of the airport And you can imagine the access that they would have. And he was working in one of these types of duty-free shops. And because they sold alcohol, he did not want to be involved anymore. And so he quits. So lucky for us, his complete buying into this way of thinking caused him to leave the airport and thus made an attack at LAX much more difficult. So talk about what the overall plan of attack would be. Among the documents that we found, there was a document called Modes of Attack. This was written um, 
between Kevin James and LeVar Washington. And in the modes of attack document, they specifically call out different targets they were interested in. The Jewish community was one, specifically the LL ticket counter at LAX. The other one had to do with uh, military and their dislike for the military. And so it involved army recruiting stations. They had about 12 recruiting stations that they, they were targeting, as well as one of the military bases. And then there was the Israeli consulate. These were some of the targets that were listed in this document. So how close were they to launching an attack? They were really close. So symbolically, they had chosen the date of September 11th, 2005. Again, they wanted to it to this attack to occur on the 11th of September. If you think about it, we're in July. We're just a few months before that. And they had done a lot, had gone through several phases of preparing. So you had Kevin James kind of teaching the philosophy, Kevin James recruiting Washington, Washington coming out, doing what he was told to do was to go out and build this cell. He had already recruited two others. And they were even in the stage where they were practicing with firearms. We, um, we, we got some evidence of them training out in a park in L.A. Sh uh, shooting. And another interesting thing about this case was the fact that this case did not involve suicide bombing, massive explosive devices. In fact, there were no explosives at all. They decided to use weapons, guns, rifles, which at the time when you're thinking about, wow, this mass casualty in the form of, of explosive devices, it wasn't, it, you look at it and go like, well, maybe it wasn't a major attack. However, fast forward to just a decade or so, you know, in this past decade or so, and you could see that terrorism activities started to involve a lot of this kind of lone wolf perpetrator with a weapon, with a gun. And so this was kind of the beginnings of seeing that you did not need to have um, explosives in order to create a terrorist attack and have that type of impact. What happened with Washington and Patterson? Did they stay in custody? Yeah, so they both stayed in custody. We, again, had 24-hour surveillance. We needed to find out, first of all, who were these other folks that had been radicalized and had been out there. And one of the most amazing parts of this investigative story was just how the law enforcement community in L.A. came together. I remember we held... This would have been now July 7th, the morning of July 7th, an emergency meeting of the Joint Terrorism Task Force Executive Committee. And this emergency meeting was held in Westwood at the FBI office, and we had brought together all of our partners into this room. And we literally just started divvying out responsibilities. And so, for example, one of the things that we knew were that some of these folks that radicalized and Folsom were now out on the street. A lot of them had criminal well, they all had criminal past, but a lot of them were involved in drugs. So the DEA stepped up to the plate and they end up taking the lead of going out and through their network and through all the, the work that they do in the in the narcotics world. They were responsible for trying to track down these people and they found every single one of them. It wasn't long before we had all of these people identified and interviewed and in custody, many of them on things nothing more than their name was so-and-so, first name, last name unknown. And the DEA did a remarkable job of tracking all of those folks down. Ultimately, how was this case resolved? Yeah, so ultimately what we do is we, we identify everybody that in one form or fashion had been radicalized by Kevin James or LeVar Washington. We put together our indictments we build the conspiracy case of showing how all of this had been put together. We came so close to an attack actually happening, but luckily we ended up indicting all of these people. And this is where the interesting, I, I may have mentioned that the, there are two kind of historic events, or there are two historic events that occurred, one at the beginning of this case that caused people not to really see what was happening in the media because everybody was focused on the London bombing. And I remember when the actual indictments are being announced by the, the attorney general, again, I'm looking up at the screen and you could see the attorney general at the press conference with Director Mueller. And down in the corner is this huge red circle. And this had been just a couple of days since Katrina had made landfall into, into Louisiana. So you had the London bombings at the beginning and Katrina at the end. And right in the middle was this incredible terrorism case 
and this disruption of this plot that occurred with all of these men and women coming together. And so it's almost as if this got lost, um, swept up in the, in the winds of Katrina, so to speak. One thing that I remember about this case is the fact that Kevin James had worked for almost 10 years doing what he was doing, trying to radicalize these prison inmates, and it had just gone completely under the radar with the prison system. Yeah, that's it's it's so true. And and one of the challenges was the fact that these folks were hiding behind this religious freedom that they had, the the, the right to practice their religion. They were hiding behind that and they had formed this kind of splinter radical group called JIS. And so it was difficult sometimes for for the Bureau of Prisons to kind of understand exactly what was going on. It took a little bit of time for them to do that. But a lot has changed now. And one of the biggest changes was the integration or the better integration between the, the prisons and the men and women that work at the prisons and the Joint Terrorism Task Forces and just that better flow of information, as well as intelligence and understanding what are the indicators of potential radicalization. And so um, it, it was the beginning of not only kind of this engagement with regards to you know, Folsom Prison, but this happened throughout the country. And I would even say internationally, the focus on how prisons, I mean, if you think about it, it's almost like the the perfect environment for this radicalization to occur. Because one, you have, you have violent inmates in there who are oftentimes as they come in, they're looking to join with some sort of group in order to, for survival, but then they're also looking for some sort of spirituality and then so you have this charismatic man who's able to basically convert them and, you know, they can they can hide by utilizing well-known gang methods and prison gang methods of concealing the way that they communicate and so on. So it was a, it's an environment that created this uh, this breeding ground, if you will, for these radicalized ideas. As a result of you and your team's work, Kevin James received a 16 year sentence. Washington got 22 years, Patterson got 12 and a half years, and Samana, who had mental health issues, was dealt with outside of the criminal justice system. So yeah, there was a successful conclusion to this long investigation of literally sleeping on the couch in my boss's office because you couldn't, I couldn't drive down to South Orange County and it was just nonstop, but, um, but just tremendous work by everybody. Eric, you wound up moving on and moving up in the FBI, and you became in charge of the intelligence program for the entire FBI there at FBI headquarters. When it comes to homegrown violent extremists and prison radicalization, how much of a threat is that right now? It's still a huge threat. You could see over the past decade over the um, the homegrown violent extremism and the types of uh, cases that we were seeing seem to be more of that, this kind of less sophisticated, less time to plan or necessity to plan these types of attack became more prevalent. You know, the prisons, they still, you know, as we, as the Bureau was arresting folks and then ultimately convicting them and they were going into prison, it was almost kind of feeding this. And now you're, now these people who are thinking this way are actually in this environment. So even though we didn't see a ton of cases of it like like we did in the GIS, where it actually comes all the way to fruition, it still is an environment in which a lot of that radicalization is occurring. One thing I've said on this show is I wish the public could see how many terrorist attacks have been thwarted as a result of all of the hard work of the FBI and its partners by great investigative work, having informants out on the ground, so many cases have been prevented based on all the hard work and collaboration in the law enforcement community. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that um, when it comes to measuring the success of, a, of an anti-terrorism program is, you know, success is measured by nothing happening. As we investigated all of these matters, undoubtedly, there were hundreds of events that could have gone further if not for the work of, of law enforcement. And there are many, many that are public that are disruptions that occurred all the time. And really the diabolical plots that these folks come up with, and, and a lot of these are American-born violent extremists. So that's the scary part, is that we don't have to look overseas to see the threat. The threat is in our own backyard. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about it. LeVar Washington was an American born here, Gregory Patterson, Kevin James. And interestingly enough, Samana, who was the Pakistani individual who was also indicted, Washington radicalized him. So the influence that some of these folks that really buy into this philosophy and their ability to get people to think like them, that's really scary. How did this case impact you? First of all, it was it was one of those cases that really showed me how important it is to bring everybody, and I mean everybody, to the table to counter this threat of terrorism. You know, the concept of fusion is is out there. And this is this is one of these events in which fusion and what I mean by fusion is taking expertise that a particular agency or a particular division within an agency has and then combining those with counterterrorism agents and creating this environment in which people are sharing ideas, thinking outside of the box. And this was one of those cases where we, you know, we brought in uh, our DEA partners. We had L.A. sheriffs, LAPD we had our DOD friends and partners that came to the table. And this concept of fusion is still, you still see it. And it's it's probably one of the best instruments that we have to combat terrorism. You see fusion centers, which are these state and local intelligence centers. They're, they're bringing together lots of people. Even within headquarters, you started seeing fusion between counterterrorism division elements and criminal division elements on hate crimes, for example, bringing those men and women together and allowing them to think of new ways and new ideas. So to me, that is one of the big secrets of success is really breaking down all of those barriers and bringing all these people together to counter this this common threat. So when you were in charge of the intelligence program for the FBI, did you remember this case? That Did, did this case inspire you to do anything different when, once you reached that position? Yeah, it, it inspired me. It, it it taught me a lot. One of the things, the great privilege and honor that I had of, of leading the intelligence program from the FBI was really to understand the tremendous value that our intelligence analysts are bringing to the table. We have this incredible team of analysts that their specialty is to look for things before they happen. They're, they're, they're not there to, to tell you the results of a crime scene or tell you how that, that, or, or the results of a particular trial. They're there to help you understand what these particular threats and indicators. And so one of the great, great transformations of, of the Bureau was the fact that these analysts and these agents were now working together One, keeping an eye on the perimeter of things that that we don't know yet, looking for indicators, and the other really focusing on the what we know right now and what do we have in front of us. And those two forces coming together is really what creates this this really neat umbrella, if you will, that uh, helps us go after these very hard to detect threats. I did want to say that I was able to tell this story, but really I was just a character, one of the characters in this cast of really, really talented, lots of talented people that came together. So I just wanted to call out everybody that came together at that time to stop this attack. All right. Well, thanks for being on the show, Eric. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed having Eric on the show. I always admired him as a leader, but there's something that comes with fighting the fight and working in the trenches with someone that creates a bond. And we certainly created those bonds with our friends and colleagues working terrorism cases after 9-11. For more information about our show, go to BehindTheCrimeScene.com, sign up to be a subscriber, and we'll send you all the updates about the show. Also, follow us on Facebook at Behind the Crime Scene and on Twitter at Behind the Crime 2. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time Behind the Crime Scene. Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne is produced and edited by Lisa Osborne. Theme music is Insomnia by retired IRS Special Agent Clarissa Balmaceda. Find us on social media through BehindTheCrimeScene.com. And don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Osborne.